Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Empowering Musicians podcast. I'm your host, Michael Manley, and I'm very happy to welcome um, my good friend Donato Cabrera to the show today. Donato is a conductor and music director of both the California Symphony and the Las Vegas Philharmonic. And welcome to the show, Donato. Michael, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me to your show. Uh, we were just reminiscing before we started uh, how we all of us were uh, trying our best to stay connected with our uh, with with our incredible supporters uh, of of uh, of what we do and during the lockdown and it's so wonderful to see that you've you've continued this past the expiration date of the of the pandemic uh, because I think it's really important that we still use this this technology to to reach out. Uh, and and to reach as many people as possible to tell our stories. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, one of my aims in this podcast is to really talk about everything that artists need that doesn't necessarily involve the practice of their craft and also to sort of educate others about how artists make a living, what their career paths look like, and how they get into what they do. Um, so I'm very curious to, to explore your path um, I understand you probably started as a musician and then went, in, went into conducting, right? Because not a lot of people are in high school and they say, I want to be Leonard Bernstein, right? They start as, as instrumentalists. And so were you also a French horn player, I believe, I recall? I was, I was. Before that, though, I, I studied piano and played the piano. And that initial dive into music was inspired by my well, both of my grandmothers, but particularly my my uh, my father's mother, who played piano. She wasn't professional; wasn't a professional pianist by any stretch of the imagination. But what I loved about her abilities as a pianist was, in a sense, non musical, in that she was able to gather the family around uh, her piano in the living room after dinner or after. Uh, or in the afternoon, and she would play. She would play her favorite songs, and it would connect us all in a way that was so special and magical. And it was that this this ability to bring people together that inspired me to ask my parents on the trip back home to where we were living that I wanted to learn how to play the piano. And it is it is interesting to me that well, I think all artists are this way it, that. We, we have this need and desire to connect to other people. But with con uh, through my then uh, uh, choice of choosing the French horn in middle school, uh, this idea of this communal experience of art changing the artist in real time, as well as the audience, uh, is something that really has always been with me in that in that pursuit. And so conducting at first was, was an outgrowth of that. In all honesty, I wanted to be like my, my high school band director. He changed my life. He, he, he turned, he, well, he stayed in my life until he passed away at the age of 85 last, just last year. He remained an incredible inspiration to me long after high school. But when I was, when I was in high school, he, his teaching, his, his demeanor, um, his way of affecting kids' lives in one, sent, sent me in the direction of being a music educator. And so for, for college, that was my goal. And while at the same time, I was becoming obsessed with classical music through, uh, through compact discs, through CDs. I, I grew up in Reno, Nevada. Uh, first, I grew up in Las Vegas, moved to Reno when I was 10. Uh, became obsessed with classical music uh, in high school through recordings. And the, the two kind of merged in college. My, my, horn, my, my horn professor, John Lenz, who still is the principal horn yeah. of the Reno Philharmonic, uh, he was then the conduct, also the conductor of the UNR Orchestra. I went to University of Nevada, Reno for my undergraduate degree. And I completely, in a, in a, in a naive way, at my first lesson of my sophomore year, I asked John if I could conduct the if I could conduct an overture on the fall concert of it, 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 with the with the university orchestra. And if I had been at any larger school that had a graduate 
uh, conductor, conducting student? Of course, the answer would have been no, but Reno, UNR did not have a graduate conducting student at that time. And John gave me the chance. And so from my sophomore year on, I started conducting the, the orchestra. Did I know what I was doing? No. <laughs> I had, looking back now, I shake my head at my younger self thinking, how on, the, how on earth did you conduct these pieces? But it, um, it sort of then led me on this path of conducting. By the, by the, time, I was gra- by the time I was about to graduate, the professors at the university were really the ones who, who kicked me out of Reno and said, listen, you should pursue conducting as a, as, as a discipline rather than music education. Wow. And I really had no idea what that meant. I didn't know really you could get a master's degree in conducting. I didn't know. And so they told me where to apply. <laughs> they said, okay, you're going to apply here, here, and here. And I did. And then um, that this, that's what took me to the University of Illinois and I got a master's in conducting and we can talk about my path further, but it really started from this desire to connect and be in to being inspired and to, to hopefully be inspiring to others. And that was really through my grandmother. Wow. That's a great story. Um, well, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, cause, cause everybody who wants to be a French horn player or a clarinetist or a guitar player, they all know that they have to just practice in the practice room and then, you know, but conducting is such an interesting skill because you can't really practice unless you have a hundred people in front of you. Um, so how do you, how do you hone the skill of being a conductor? How do you get good at it without being able to be in front of 50 or a hundred people all the time? Well, I think there are many ways of, of improving your skills as a conductor or, or if in, if in the case of someone who's interested in conducting, of observing what it means to become a conductor. As from my point of view, I, was, I played in the orchestra. When you play French horn, you play in an orchestra. And, yeah. uh, well, not, you may not be counting rests as often as our other brass colleagues or percussion, percussion friends are sitting right behind us, but there are huge, huge swaths of music where you are counting and observing of you yeah. can't help but but look around you and and see how a conductor's gestures are are affecting the sound or not affecting the sound or how when a conductor stops if what they say truly makes a difference or does not make a difference so for me because i i was a mus- music education major and i wanted to become an effective band director I was always watching conductors, all conductors, whether it was orchestra, choir, or band. And, and, and so there, yes, the act of conducting, the physical gestures of conducting can only be honed while you're doing it in front of a group, whether those gestures are working or not. But what you say to someone can be honed in conversation at all times. That's a different. That's a different set of skills that are re- that's required from a conductor. And of mm-hmm. course, I think the most important thing. I, I I don't want to assign it a percentage, but it's a large percentage, way over fifty percent, is how you understand music, and that has nothing to do with what is happening on the podium, and and the and this is where becoming a great musician through an instrument also through understanding the the process of composition that these are the things that really make a conductor great it's not necessarily well it is partly to do with the gesture but that is in my opinion far less important than how one perceives and understands music and just your 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 ability as as a musician, how well you can hear things, how well you can sing something uh, as an example to an orchestra. If you want how you want something to go, you often sing, singing it to them is the most effective way. And so uh, these basic fundamental skills that all musicians, frankly, need to be good at. Uh, these need to be very. Ex, these need to be excellent at a high level for conductors. And it has nothing to do with conducting necessarily. 
Yeah, that's so true. And there's such, I mean, the, the, the core of conducting, I, th I think when you're in the moment is being able to communicate non-verbally with, with your body, but there is score study. There's all these other things um, that are so important um, to, to the art of conducting as well. Did you have any uh, conductors who stood out to you as uh, mentors or people that you wanted, that you just got really excited about learning from? Or I know for me as a French horn player, I had um, a lot of recordings of Barry Tuckwell. He was the only French horn soloist at the time. And, um, and then John Williams was a huge inspiration to me. So did you have any inspirations as far as conductors that made you say, yeah, that's what I want to do? Well, without a doubt, and I've already mentioned him, and, and I've often thought about this uh, because he played such a crucial role. I thought, oh, maybe I'm looking back at, through rose-colored glasses. But in fact, I actually saw him conduct many times after I graduated from high school. My high school band director remains, and I know there are other, other professional musicians that went to high school with him, and they all say the same thing. He remains one of the best conductors I've ever worked under. He was clear. He was concise. He knew what to say to make people better. He knew what, what to say to make people listen to one another, which is an inc also incredible, uh, a really great attribute of, a, of a, a crucial attribute of a great conductor. So he was, for me, number one, the first great conductor and remains so. After that, I would say, oh, gosh, there are so many that I've had, I, I was so, I've been so lucky through the years to have worked personally with wonderfully inspiring and effective conductors, least, uh, not least of which, uh, certainly one of the last mentors is Michael Tilson Thomas. I was his, I was the resident conductor of the San Francisco Symphony for seven years. And those seven years are, are, will certainly be a high watermark for me in terms of see how someone's um, artistic presence can be felt organizational throughout the entire organization through its marketing, its development, of course, its artistic vision, but even all the guest conductors, the rep that he would have a, he would have an overarching message through what other people's concerts were, were, uh, were doing with the San Francisco Symphony. And that was, that was a great lesson every day was a great lesson. Uh, and certainly uh, before that, Donald Runnicles, who was the music director of the San Francisco Opera, which, which the, that was the institution that brought me to the Bay Area version from New York City. Uh, from afar, uh, certainly when I started conducting, without a doubt, Leonard Bernstein, mm -hmm. when I, I think we're of similar age, in fact, I may be a little older than you, but when I was growing up on PBS, he was still alive, and his uh, he was at the time in the mid '80s doing these live or uh, well, these great performances with the Vienna Philharmonic, and he was they were um, performing all the Brahms symphonies, I recall, uh, at, and and he would do these little uh, five minute intros, and I, I just those the intros even though they were, they were very brief, I'll never forget uh, being so inspired by them. And on top of that, I will, I have to say, I have to give real credit to my family because the great performances in Reno on, on, PB, on the local, local PBS station would happen at Thursdays at eight o'clock. Now, if you recall <laughs> uh, on, on Thursdays at eight o'clock was the Cosby show and cheers. Right. And so every other month they would give up, the family, the family watching of Cheers and 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 the Cosby Show, so I could watch these Leonard the Leonard Bernstein conducts a Vienna Philharmonic, and and, and my family's incredible. They're very uh, they're 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 wonderfully supportive, but they're not musicians. So I mean, it was a big yeah. deal. So I I, I give great. eternal thanks to my younger sister and to my father and stepmother for allowing me to 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 watch these shows. So. Yeah, Leonard Bernstein was certainly a catalyst, as he was for so many people. Yeah, uh, I'm certainly not alone in that. And um, but oh yeah, Claudio Abbado, another incredible influence. Simon Rattle later on. Um, I was very lucky to becoming uh, to uh, my obsession with classical music 
at the, was happening at the same time that the CD classical classical uh, uh, compact disc market was exploding, and and right. and everyone was recording uh, throughout the late eighties and nineties, and and I it, I really benefited from that. I have to say, yeah, that's great, and um, I think your experience conducting um, the San Francisco Symphony's Youth Orchestra. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about that because for me, I think the best conductors are the ones like I, I agree with you. I, I see some conductors here in Las Vegas who I've um, I've worked with in the band programs that are just really fine conductors because they have to be really good educators. They have to be able to train people and make them better. And I think that makes them better as conductors. So did you have that experience working with the youth orchestra? What was that like? Well, that was a that was an incredible big circle that I never thought would be completed. So when I was at UNR in the late 80s, early 90s, one of my roommates, in fact, in fact my freshman roommate, he graduated and went to the San Francisco Conservatory. So in uh, starting in 1991, 1992, I would come down to San Francisco, drive down this four, four, four hour drive. I drive down here because I didn't really know the the city of San Francisco that well. My mother lived in San Jose at the time. And so I, I would always, on my way down to see my mother, I would spend a day or two in San Francisco with, with my former roommate. And his roommate in San Francisco was one of the conducting students at the conservatory. And we've remained friends all these years later. But I, I remember one particular Saturday afternoon uh, in 90, 1991 or 1992, uh, Howie uh, was, is his name. He said, hey, what are you doing this afternoon? You want to come with me to watch a, a rehearsal? I said, oh, great. Thinking that it was, I was going to get in to see a San Francisco symphony rehearsal or San Francisco opera rehearsal. He said, I said, well, what are we going to see? He said, oh, well, there's this youth orchestra that, that is, is, is rehearsing this afternoon. I said, oh, youth orchestra? Why do I want to see a youth orchestra? He said, well, trust me. So we, we get on public transportation, go downtown to Davies Symphony Hall. I walk in for the very first time actually in my life, through the stage doors of Davy Symphony Hall, uh, how he introduced me to the Alistair Neal, who was then the music director of the youth orchestra. He was very nice to me. He said, oh, well, right now we're in, the, we're, we're, everyone's doing sectionals. So the first violins are doing their sectional right now on the main stage. So just go in and watch them. So we did. And it was, I'll never forget this. It was Prokofiev Symphony Number no. 5, Wow. It was the last movement, and I sat down, and they had this Russian, wonderfully, wonderfully in, uh, inspiring Russian coach. She was a, then a, a member of the first violin section, Zoya, and it was the closest thing to perfection I had ever heard. I I couldn't believe it. I I, I thought to myself, these can't be kids. <laughs> And then there, the break happened, and they had a 15-minute break, and then the entire orchestra got on stage at 2.30, and they proceeded to rehearse the Prokofiev Symphony 5. And that year, later on, I found out much later, they took, they took that to Moscow. They, this was, they were preparing to go on their uh, European tour, and they were going to Moscow and St. Petersburg, I believe, for that tour. And they were playing this symphony there. And I thought to my, I'll ne I, I, this was as clear as day, even it's 30 years later, thinking if I ever got to conduct in a professional orchestra or an orchestra nearly as good as this youth orchestra, I will feel like I made it. So 1992, fast forward to 2009, I become the music director of this youth, or youth orchestra. And okay. so for me, that was an incredible journey, an incredible honor. And, but to your point, my, what it brought out in me was, were my, my initial desires of what it means to be, be a conductor. I was able to really influence people, young, young aspiring musicians with me for, while they're playing this music for the very first time, whether it's Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, Mahler Symphony Number no. Five, Mahler Symphony Number no. One, all the great repertoire that I did and took on tour with them during those seven years, these were the, the these memories uh, that they have are will always be the first memories they have of these pieces, and I treated 
that experience with enormous respect and gratitude that I could share with them my experience with these pieces and giving and hopefully to to hopefully give them the tools necessary uh, so that when they when they have the chance to play these pieces again in their in their lives they will they will have that toolbox always there. So it was an, a wonderful wonderful experience for me, and I'm very proud and grateful to have been their music director. Oh, that's a wonderful story, um, and. I want to talk a little bit about the opposite situation, which is where a younger conductor, maybe you and your youth, or you get in front of like a, an orchestra like the San Francisco Symphony for the first time. And I know that musicians in those top orchestras, you know, they've, they, they're in the top 99.9 .9 percentile of their skill level. And they're used to working with people and assuming that everybody else is on that level. And then they have very little patience, right, for conductors who they might not feel a connection to. I've seen the New York Philharmonic just, you know, with guest conductors, it's like, oh, do they like this guy or this woman this, this day or not? And you can hear it sometimes immediately. So what was it like getting in front of like a, a major orchestra like San Francisco for the first time as a young conductor? Well, it, it can be, it can be all of those. It can be any, all, it can be anything you want it to be. Um, it can it's often it can be out of your hands too. Uh, I can share with you. Uh, let me just say this though. By and large, the experience was always inc uh, incredibly positive mm. because coming up, being chosen as the assistant conductor of a major symphony orchestra, um, even a. a be, if you are on staff, if you if you are an assistant conductor of any orchestra, be it large or small, you're you're one of them, and they want in general, they will give you a they will ha have a lot more patience for you because they know that their role is to help you become better. It's a lot different than if you are a guest conductor with a major symphony orchestra. That's they're they're, they're not they're not there to make you a better conductor. That's a totally different uh, scenario. And, I, and I've, seen, I've seen many instances where that relationship between a guest conductor and, a, and an orchestra, it's like oil and water. So I, I can just say, I remember uh, when I auditioned uh, for an or one of the very first auditions I had with a, a major symphony orchestra to become an assistant conductor, I... I thought, okay, I'm going to walk out on stage with a lot of energy and walk out there, not run, but walk out there with, you know, with intention. Ex I, and I did, except I tripped on the podium and I, it, I, I don't know how I didn't fall flat on my face. And the snickers of the, of the concert master and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the first desk of viol of, of violins of the string section, as I you know, fumbled onto the podium, I just, I thought I, I thought I just would, you know, I should just, you know, crawl under some rock and not even do the audition after that. It went fine and they were very nice to me, but it was just, Oh, how, how embarrassing was that? Um, and, uh, but I would say, even when you know that th this is the this is this is the challenging thing when you are when you are if you are lucky enough to get a position as I did with the New Jersey Symphony, then then San Francisco Opera, and then San Francisco Symphony. The challenging thing is most of the things that you're given with those major orchestras are children's concerts or pops concerts nowadays movies, and most of those. Most of those concerts are usually one, maybe two rehearsals, and mm -hmm. so it's it's so much pressure to bring together a concert in one rehearsal versus four rehearsals, and yeah. so you really have to be organized. You really you really have to learn how to be efficient. Um, often you barely have enough time to get through all of if you know you have a two and a half hour rehearsal for two hours of music so you you really have to be clear concise if you're going to stop at, at all you have to real you have to be able to correct many things not just one thing and so 
uh, talk about trial by fire. That is where that is the challenge is is getting together these. And yes, these orchestras can basically play everything perfectly at, a, at one rehearsal. But nevertheless, you know, it's still that's that's the challenge. And that's where you that's the trial by fire that you have to go through as, as an as assistant conductor. Yeah. Well, um, and from there, you've you've now attained the title of music director of, of two orchestras. And so conducting is really the skill, right? That's the, the practice. But being a music director is a, a bit more involved. So what what does the role of a music director in 2023 look like for an orchestra like the California Symphony, for example? Well, in, in the 10 years or so since I've become a music director, mm -hmm. uh, first it was with the Green Bay Symphony, then it was with the New Hampshire Music Festival, and then along the way, uh, first it was the California Symphony, then a year later with the Las Vegas Philharmonic. And in these last 10 to 12 years, actually the role of, a, of what is expected of a music director has, has changed even more. When I first started, it was, I would say it was very traditional um, in, in that you were, to, you were expected to have an, a very clear artistic vision of what you would want to program. And really the only challenge you had to do was that if you, you, thought, if you thought it was important to do uh, music by living composers, your, your goal then was to, conv to be convincing uh, to the board and to the marketing department and to the audience, to the stakeholders basically, that doing music by living composers was relevant and necessary which is I certainly fall into that camp. However, since I've been music director and, and thank goodness for this, it has now, now it is not just music by living composers, but we need to be do, doing music by, by women. But, you know, this, the, the diversity quotient has finally come to this art form, art form and we are now expected as we should be, we do be do, to not only be new, doing music by living composers, by, but by music by women composers, by composers of color, and 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 thank God for that. But that wasn't the case when I was became music director ten years ago, and it's been wonderful to see um, see how this is how this has been dealt with by not only the major symphony orchestras, but by both of my orchestras. In the case of the California Symphony, we had a jump. We had a we had a jump on on this because in 2017 we felt that long before the Me Too and 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 George Floyd and, and Black Lives Matter we we had set in motion a, a call to diversity that was was basically be, had become policy and so by the time by the time the pandemic arrived 2020 etc cetera, etc cetera, we were already well underway in in celebrating these 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 um, these things that these these uh, composers who had been underrepresented uh, for so long so um, but nevertheless I what where we sit now as musicians and members of an orchestra or as music directors I think it's actually I was thinking about this this morning uh, it's really exciting we, we're now we're now doing we're now performing repertoire that is relevant to our society and it only took 200 years but here we are at that at this time and place yeah yeah no absolutely and um i think that's so crucial the idea of like really reflecting our community and um in in not only our personnel but also in the in the music that we make as well um and i know that in in 2023 especially I think now the conductors are also expected to kind of be ambassadors to the community, the music director rather, and also um, take on some responsibility and fundraising and all of those things. Do you find that, that that was a different skill you had to also master as well as conducting? Or is that something that is a complement to the conducting or do you feel that it's an additional work that you have to do or? Personally for me, and it was it's because of really this this wonderful job that I got when I was a, a senior in high school in Reno when I was about in March 
to, of 1988, I walked into what was then the, the CD store in Reno, where if you were a classical fanatic or jazz, you know, sort of the uh, esoterica of, of recordings, you would go to this place called appropriately named the CD store. <laughs> yeah. That was the name. And, yeah. and uh, I applied for a job. And because of mine, already I had pretty good knowledge of classical recordings. The owner hired me. And in this, I ended up working there for uh, seven years until I left to do my master's. And in those seven years, I got to meet these these people who I still love meeting, which are people who are obsessed with music in, as much as we are as musicians, but aren't musicians. Mm -hmm. and, and they would come in every week during, back then the new release day was Tuesdays. And whether, whether it was rock, jazz, classical, world music, didn't matter, that was when all the uh, new music was released. And those folks, I just had, whether they were a doctor or they worked for the school district or the power company, talking with them about music was so inspiring to me. And I never lost that love of connecting with people. And so as a music director, that, that fit right in for me because I don't know if you know this, but when for Las Vegas Philharmonic concerts, uh, for during the intermission and sometimes after the concert's over, I go to the lobby. And my mm -hmm. goal when I go to the lobby to chat with people, it's just to act, just to interact with them about the music that they're hearing, and yeah. and so that connection, uh, for me, that's not an added part of the job. That's actually like a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. truly love that, and and when I also when I talk to the audience before each piece, I I try to chat with them about why I chose the music. Why mm -hmm. why are they sitting here listening to? Uh, an overture by Sibelius, by Sibelius, or or a new piece of music written by Jesse Montgomery, or or a concerto by Prokofiev. There's a reason why I chose it, and I think they should know why. And 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 it's not the reasons are as simple as why they would choose a recording to listen to at home by their by by the Beatles. Like it's the same reason. So yeah, connecting connecting to the audience, which in turn is fundraising. Uh, right. And is in turn development. That's that's a joy for me, frankly. That's great. Um, have you commissioned any new pieces for either of your orchestras? And and who are the composers that you think are important? The younger or or I would say contemporary composers that you feel that you want to champion as a conductor. I was very lucky when I became music director of the California Symphony. I took over. Uh, an orchestra that had already had a very well-known composer in residency program mm. called the Young American Composer in Residence. And this this young this this composer in residence is it's a three-year residency. And every year at the usually the last concert of the season, we premiere one piece. We commission and premiere a piece. So I've commissioned in 10 seasons. I've been a part of 30 commissions with the California Symphony. Uh, and as important, if not more importantly, I've been in it, part of the development of these composers because they don't only come here to have hear their piece being premiered at the final concert. They come at least once in the middle of the season to do a 30 minute uh, reading session with the orchestra of ideas that they're having about that piece that will later that will be later commissioned, which is totally unique, and that's why this 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 residency is has, is is so popular and well known because this does not happen. It's a lot of money, and uh, to have to have an orchestra for thirty minutes basically as a crayon box to experiment is is such a gift. Talk up talking about talk about uh, not having. Um, the ability to work with the thing that you're you are supposed to be doing like conducting you know it's it's a privilege to have the two and a half hours to work with an orchestra can you imagine for composers they never get that they sit in their little room with their midi sounds and they 
you know, as close as they can hope they can create these scores, but they often, more often than not, they will not hear that the first sounds of that composition till the first rehearsal, a couple of days before the concert. And that's, that's a shame. So anyway, we, we try our best. So over the years before my time, Mason Bates was one of the composers in residence with the California Symphony, Kevin Putz, Christopher Theophanides, uh, they're for made there who are now major composers in, in our world. And during my time, uh, DJ Spar, who fantastic composer, he, 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 one of his operas was just performed by uh, opera Las Vegas, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Muhammad Ali uh, opera, which oh, yeah. was a couple of months ago. Uh, uh, Katie Balch, um, Dan Visconti, uh, now Viet Quang, he's a, a, our current composer in residence who is now a professor of composition at UNLV. Yeah. And beginning next season, Asad Haddad, who is a, another fantastically gifted uh, composer. He, be, he begins his three-year residence. So that has been, I, I, I am just, I feel honored to be part of this history of the California Symphony. And, and, the, and the, the fact that I been able to commission already 30 pieces from these incredible composers has, has been a gift. At the Las Vegas Philharmonic, uh, we were part, uh, how orchestras typically commission these days is they become a co-commissioner. Uh, mm -hmm. so because, you know, to commission a piece by a composer is expensive. So what these, what these uh, composers often do, well, they create a consortium of orchestras. So the first piece that I did in, in that context was uh, we were a consort, part of a consortium for the world premiere of Philip Glass's Piano Concerto Number no. 3. And Simona Dinnerstein came to, she was, she was a person who initiated the, the commission, and she came to perform it with the Las Vegas Philharmonic. Oh, sometime before the pandemic. I never, you know, be, one of those years before the pandemic, yeah. 2017 or 18. And yeah. uh, and then after, since then, we had, uh, we were part again of another consortium through uh, New Music USA uh, with um, Juan Pablo Contreras. He, uh, we premiered uh, his Mexicano, uh, which um, has now gone, we were, we were the lead orchestra so we had the world premiere in las vegas and they, it has since gone around to with all the other consortium members to have its performances so it's it's i think it's very it's it like i said earlier um performing music by living composers commissioning new pieces it keeps the art form relevant it keeps the art form um con continually refreshing itself uh all art needs to be regenerative or it dies. And classical music is no exception. Orchestral music is no ex exception. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think what you, we, we touched on was so crucial. And even 30 minutes is not a lot of time for a young composer, right? But it's, it's the complete opposite of how, say, a piece of theater would be, would be born. Like you would have readings, you would have workshops, there's all kinds of honing that goes on with performers and you'd have test audio, you know, you previews with test audiences. I mean, I, I mean, writers as, as esteemed as like Edward Albee would make changes during a play's Broadway preview run. Like, okay, that's not working or this is not Absolutely. working. Absolutely. And, and it's just absurd to me that we don't do that in our industry, you know? It is, you know, a lot of it, uh, I think a lot of it had to do, of course, with the rising costs of orchestras throughout the 20th century. Um, but even even with the premieres of of Beethoven symphonies and uh, and not so much later on with Brahms symphonies, but there were there was a period of time where gestation period where mm. it would have a premiere, private premieres in the if, for instance the premiere of the uh, Beethoven's Eroica symphony. There was a private premiere in a palace in the middle of Vienna, and then there was a public premiere. And in those, in and in that time, there were corrections made, and and it the, the piece was honed. I I think, I think there is there is this misconception that a composer is expected to go into their white tower and through some sort of divination and magical spells come out with a perfectly written piece, and that's never been the case, and it certainly shouldn't be the case now. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because my connection with that is, is um, the one connection I have is through 
the League of American Orchestras, and we had a commissioning project called Forward Made in America. And I was kind of uh, shepherding that program in its second iteration. And the first round was Joan Tower. And she wrote a very, she asked a lot of really good questions. She wrote a really, um, the piece was a perfect piece because it was being premiered by smaller orchestras, sometimes um, youth orchestras, sometimes community orchestras. And then um, the second round was uh, Joseph Schwantner, whose music I adore. And, um, and he just happened to write the hardest piece of music ever written for an orchestra. And so it was like, well, if the composer had a chance to like maybe think this through more or know a little bit more about the orchestra's playing it, like maybe it would have been a, a different sort of, uh, he, made, he, he or she may have made different choices. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's crucial because it's not enough just to say, okay, the brief is you have to write for not five trombones, but only two and pairs of winds. Like, you have to know who you're writing for as well, and like what, what the, what the capability is, and and what the whole it's it's like a whole context for composers, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and well, so I think it's also you know when we maybe you can share when we first met. You know, it's yeah. young young conductors and young composers are in this similar similar boat of of, of really not having enough opportunity to hone their craft. Uh, and and I think the league over the years has tried to bridge that gap, and and that's how we first met. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you were you were in the uh, the conductor showcase that we used to do at the league, and I think they still do that at the League of America. Orchestra. They do, they um, do. But I thought that was such a it's such a wonderful program because yes. Uh, I, at the time, I had just gotten the position with the San Francisco Symphony, but nevertheless, managers and, and orchestras that might be looking for a new music director or might be considering starting a music director search, they're not going to fly. They don't have the resources to fly to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Seattle, New York City, Pittsburgh, to see all of the, the uh, aspiring conductors as assistant conductors conduct a movie or a young people's concerts. So this yeah. program, the Conductor Showcase, which was at, during that year, was at the Nashville Symphony, brought yeah. together these aspiring conductors, I shouldn't say aspiring conductors, they were all, uh, all of us were already uh, well along our way as assistant conductors with orchestras for the most part. And we, and, and, these, and these folks who are, you know, uh, regional orchestras uh, and managers, they had a chance to see a bunch of conductors in one place in Nashville, working with a pretty, with the Nashville Symphony, which is yeah. which is wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Yeah, and then and and it was a. I just remember thinking, what a great orchestra the Nashville Symphony is, and what a beautiful hall they have. Um, that okay. hall was just spectacular. Um, but I, you know, what's interesting about conductors and composers, unlike musicians. So this is where there's like some difference, right? And I often say that, like, if you're truly a creative person you might want to think about composing and conducting because being an orchestral musician is not terribly creative. It's much more athletic in, in some ways, right? Because you're an interpreter, you're dealing with playing things how other people want to want them to be played and the conductor determines how fast or slow or what, what volume and all of those things. Um, and, and, and the, it's a very objective process, right? Like if you're in an audition, it's like, okay, well, this person clammed this note, this person didn't. So there's an objective measure of, of trying to determine uh, some sort of um, skill level. But with composers and conductors, it's so subjective. And I remember being in a panel at the League of American Orchestras, watching conductor tapes with some artistic directors from big orchestras. And they would see somebody that they thought was terrible. And I was like, wow, that was great. And, and they would see somebody that they thought was great that I thought was absolutely terrible. So yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's incredibly subjective. And so, do you do you find that hard to navigate because it's not like um, being a, a French horn player where it's like I just have to play all the right notes at the right time in the right uh, into, yeah. with the right intonation or how do you navigate that? That's a wonderful observation and very true, um, in in a, in the sense that if you are an orchestral musician, um, you know I can't remember when this statistic came out years ago, I remember when I was reading about this sort of shockingly when I was a music education major that one of the most unhappiest professions were postal workers and orchestral musicians. And I thought, how on earth 
Could you be unhappy as an orchestra musician? But now I could see how someone who perhaps had a creative bent as anyone starting, an in, starting to play an instrument would, uh, then gets into an orchestra. And as you mentioned, it's, it's about, it's like joining a baseball team. It's like, okay, what's your ERA and what's your, <laughs> what's your you know, what's your batting average? It better be close to a thousand. Um, right. And, and so it, it, there is something very athletic about it. And, and when, however, being a composer or a conductor, it's, it's the, uh, the exact opposite side of the pendulum in that there, it, you are, uh, successful based on on large part on on perce the perception of who you are and what you do and and it may not have anything to do with your skills uh, or your education or your uh, your success rate if there's such a thing it's very similar to it be, then it becomes very similarly similar to becoming an actor in that ninety nine percent of the time you're told no. And there's that right. one percent where you, you walk in into an audition and you you said yeah we like we like you, and so it's it's there couldn't be it's very opposite sides of the same of the same profession really, yeah yeah, I just want to uh, take a pause here to say uh, we have a comment from Lily Barrera from Mexico she says greetings from Mexico hope to see you soon Donato so um, oh, great to have Lily, uh, you know uh, one of the greatest gifts that this of uh, many gifts that becoming a conductor has given me is the 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 um, gift of seeing the world and my mexican family moved mostly to the united states a hundred years ago and and i'm like so many uh, children grandchildren great grandchildren of immigrants the language was lost uh my my grandparents they they knew spanish uh, and they spoke Spanish to each other and to their sisters and brothers, my great aunts and uncles, but they did not speak Spanish to my father and to my uncle. So within one generation, it was lost. But then as I started conducting uh, with regularity, I was invited. I started to be invited to uh, uh, orchestras, South America and Chile, and then to many orchestras in Mexico. And I've been so grateful because my all of my Mexican family I don't know any people who stayed in Mexico, really. They're all in the United States. And actually, the, the last time I conducted an, or an orchestra in Mexico was in, in Guanajuato, which was the birth birthplace of my grandfather, whom I'm named after. My grandfather's name was Donato Cabrera. And my, wow. my cousins and my sister, they all flew down to see the concert and to see for the first time the city where my grandfather came from. So it's been it's an incredible gift, and and Lily was is 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 someone who who I worked with in 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 Mexico. I'm so happy for that. I'm so grateful. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I'm so glad we have people from all over checking out the podcast, and um, it's always great to see comments like that. Um, so welcome, Lily, to the show, and so glad you're watching. Um, what? So I have just two more questions, and one is um, about. I'll start with the pandemic and how, what coming out of that, have you noticed, I know, I know there's like in the New York, in New York city, the Metropolitan Opera is really struggling getting mm -hmm. folks back in the seats. And has it affected you with the orchestras that you conduct in terms of like getting audiences back to the hall and, and how did you um, stay connected and um, through the pandemic with, with audiences and, and with, um, and, and, and how do you keep the musicians, you know, at the top of their game and all of that as a conductor? What, how did you manage that through the pandemic? Well, like all of us, uh, didn't know what to think when it, when it first started. And um, I believe it was about a week or two into it that uh, I first thought, OK, I'm going to make a pledge. It, you know, it's not going to last very long. I, I can handle this, I think. I will write a, a blog every day until my first rehearsal. That can't be longer than a couple of weeks, right? Right. So 172 days later, I had I had amassed this. But it's still on, I, it's still available. I I joined Medium.com, which is a place where many people write blogs. It, I, I named it the Music Plays On, and it's not like I wrote a math. Certainly, I didn't write a masterpiece every day, but. I what I decided to do was I sh focus on a piece of music that 
I came up with every day and shared with them my favorite recordings if I could find them on YouTube or performances on YouTube. Uh, and that quickly branched out on, into, um, you know, I remember one of the blogs was my, my favorite concert venues that I've been lucky enough to go. I went as, as a resident conductor of the San Francisco Symphony, we performed in basically all the famous venues around the world. And I, I was, I was usually the only person sitting in the hall for the dress, for the, the sound check. And I really got to know these venues really well. Another one was, uh, uh, I did a, I did one on Erasure, The Innocence. It was one of my favorite albums when I was a kid growing up. <laughs> and yeah. so it was, it's Miles Davis, John Prine. When John Prine died, I did a, a blog on him. So I did that for 172 days. And then I did a weekly show just like this one. I started that about three weeks into it. It was an hour yeah. long. And as we were mentioning, as we were talking about before we, we went live, I, uh, I was so fortunate to really reach a lot of people who were, who were mostly uh, donors and friends and concert goers of the Las Vegas Philharmonic and the California Symphony. And they needed something to latch on to. And I interviewed uh, some of our friends who are chefs in Las Vegas to musicians around the world to a community and arts leaders in, in, in the Bay area and in Las Vegas. And, and again, up, all over the place. And that also lasted for, you know, many months. And I was happy to do that. So getting out of the pandemic, it's been very interesting with my, specifically my two orchestras because they're in different parts of the country with mm -hmm. the Las Vegas Philharmonic, as you know, it basically we're back to exactly where we were before. We have we're we're selling out. We know we the hall that we play play in at the Smith Center Reynolds Hall, it seats two thousand and fifty five people, and we have sold out many times this last season. This last concert we did, which was Tchaikovsky Prokofiev from Sibelius, we had around sixteen hundred and fifty tick people inside that hall, which is yeah. incredible. I mean, yeah. frankly, uh, you know. The, audio, the the orchestras in the much bigger cities would uh, would die to have the, our our audiences and I as opposed to the California Symphony which is part of the Bay Area and we were very the Bay Area like a lot of the other major metropolitan areas we were very strict during COVID and well after well along you know not until very recently you know were masks let, let you know. Uh, is, you know, said it was okay to not wear masks. So I think that I don't, I'm not a public health expert, but I think there is a correlation, unfortunately, between the communities and regions of the country that were stricter with COVID protocols longer. Mm -hmm. I think those, those regions have seen less people come back to the concert hall than regions that were less strict uh, like like Las Vegas or Texas, Florida, the the audiences came back quicker, and for better or for worse, that's the reality that we're in now. So it's it is a challenge, and it is something that many arts institutions are struggling to figure out how to to change. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I mean I've been really uh, encouraged by Las Vegas in terms of the audiences because the ha the halls have been full when I've when I've been in in there with the orchestra and so it's it's been great to see that um, and you know the, the we're lucky to have the Smith Center which is a, a really gorgeous hall and and the the city is very proud of it and it's not you know it's not on the strip it's not part of the whole economic casino uh, gaming and resort culture that we have and people don't realize that Las Vegas is a great a great food city among other things but also we have this this cultural um, uh, life as well and I, I think it's very young but I, I'm encouraged and I'm, I'm hoping it's going to grow um, it's great that we have so many sports teams coming here but eventually I think we also want to also invest in our culture and I think we're doing that uh, slowly but surely here um, but the last, I guess the last, uh, question I would have for you today is, um, now that you are a more seasoned professional music director, how do you, um, give back to the younger conductors who are coming up and what, what connection do you have to the next generation of conductors? 
It, it's a great question, and it's something that question's really been on my mind over the last year or two, because <laughs> I do feel that this decade or so of, of, of being a music director, being a guest conductor, uh, has given me some insight uh, and some experience that I wish I knew 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And I am now, um, um, I have a new position with the California Symphony Art as artistic director. And one of the initiatives that I am, I've been talking about um, incorporating into the California Symphony is a residency that's similar to the composer and residency we already have, but for young conductors. And I've been in talks with the with the music director of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, who has who has just rekindled a conducting program, and uh, and it's to do just that. It's to give young conductors uh, every opportunity to observe, to 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 uh, be part of a board meeting. You know, I didn't, I had never really been part of a board meeting until I became the music director of an or orchestra. That should not be the case. People should, a, a young conductor should know what a board meeting is all about and what their role is and yeah. what is expected of them and how you can, you can guide a board over the course of many years uh, to, to inspire them, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of, of creating right now. And uh, I hope that we can get this off the ground very soon. That's really wonderful. I mean, I hope so too. And uh, it's much needed, I would, I would say, um, in, the, in the industry, in the field. Um, my good friend, Chuck McGuire, who's been a guest on the show, and you know Chuck uh, is a, another Las Vegas conductor, works with the Desert Winds down in Henderson. And he is the, um, the director of the, the Pinecrest school system and he was just telling me the other day that they they went to a competition with their bands and the judges couldn't believe that like they had like a seventh grader conducting one of the pieces like they actually they they've incorporated conducting as part of their curriculum in in the middle and high school band program which i think is amazing and, and that's kind of yeah my, so, my, high, my high school band director because he knew that i was going to be wanted to become a high school band director when during my senior year he did the same thing for me, he he took me out to the middle school theater middle school middle school that he was also ban the band director for, and he gave me. He said, "Okay, make them better." <laughs> it was yeah. an incredible opportunity. I'll never forget that. That's amazing. So, um, before we close, how do folks connect with you, and how do folks find you, and want to keep up with you? I'm well, for better or for worse, I am on on social media quite quite a bit um so certainly the facebook i can we can add uh, i can share my facebook page instagram twitter and then donatocabrera.com is my my website which has all of my uh, my calendar etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'm pretty pretty easily uh, accessible that's great well i just want to thank you so much for spending um this hour with us this morning donato it's been great i think you're the first orchestral conductor that i've had on the show so um it's been I'm honored to be the first and and uh, and i've watched your shows and you're doing such a wonderful wonderful service for our communities and so keep it up michael thank you well thank you donato and i really appreciate that and i appreciate the support and um look forward to seeing you um either at the stage door or even on stage with you one day uh soon and uh thank you again and we'll see everybody next week we need to we need to go out to uh, some of our favorite restaurants together because I know you're a foodie like me. Oh, absolutely yes. And so a uh, footnote: I have some other music uh, friends who are huge supporters of music here in town, and they moved from California um, to Las Vegas um, mostly because they ate dinner at Sparrow and Wolf. Um, <laughs> a totally justifiable reason to move to yes. a city. It's such a great restaurant. Uh, but we, we have a, a little band of foodies that um, I've named the Intrepid Vegas Food Posse. So we will definitely I have remember. to have you join. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to have you as a, as a member and get you a pin and everything. So we'll do that next time you're in town. So absolutely. Take care. Great. Well, thanks again. And we'll see everybody next week. Take care. <laughs>